Welcome to the TJ Malden Leadership Podcast, where we talk about life, leadership, and the gospel. Hey, everybody. I'm so glad that, uh, that you're hanging out with me today on the TJ Mall Leadership Podcast. Listen, um, it would mean a great deal to me uh, just from the jump. If, if, if you would like, subscribe, share, just do the thing, all right? Um, if this is meaningful to you, if this is encouraging to you, just go ahead and, and click that share button and let everybody know, uh, everybody that you know, know that you know about this and that you like it. So uh, anyways, our team would be incredibly grateful because they work really hard on this stuff. Um, but yeah. Thanks. Today, I really, uh, I want to talk about a law. Um, I read 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John Maxwell probably 15 years ago. And it was one of the first books, one of the first leadership books that I I really kind of threw myself into and, and started trying to apply the principles from it and the laws from it to my life. And obviously there's 21 <laughs> irrefutable laws of leadership. So there's a there's a bunch of laws, a bunch of perspectives to be gleaned from the book. But there was one law for me that really kind of, if you were to sift them all together, it really kind of rose to the surface. And it's been a law that in my life, I've seen this flesh itself out over and over again. I've seen it be, be so true over and over again. And, and over the last couple of weeks, um, I've been going through um, just personal things in my life, evaluating my leadership, evaluating my uh, my parenting, evaluating our organization here as a church, evaluating my friendships, my marriage. I mean, really everything has been on the whiteboard of my mind and my heart. And I've just been kind of picking it apart. And um, I've, I've kind of been in my head about some things, to be honest. And uh, this was one of the laws that, that I've been challenging myself with and thinking back through. So it's really, uh, if you will, it's a resurrection of a law from John Maxwell, and it's called the law of the lid. And the way that I interpret it in my life is really the power or the problem with capacity and of capacity, the power of capacity in our lives. And John Maxwell says this, he says, leadership ability is the lid that determines a person's level of effectiveness. The lower an individual's ability to lead, the lower the lid on his potential on their potential, his or her potential. So, so it's this idea that my capacity, my capacity to, to lead, my capacity to organize, my capacity to delegate is going to positively or negatively affect the organization that I'm a part of. And I've been thinking about this recently just for my marriage, Man, my capacity to love my wife to listen to my wife, to forgive my wife, my capacity is going to be the lid of our marriage. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, and we're going to get here in a minute. You're going to say, oh, TJ, well, well what about my wife's ability to listen to me or, or my husband's ability to, to, to talk to me or to communicate? No, no, no. Like my, my lid, my capacity, my capacity will be the lid for my life. We're not going to blame shift. Today, we're going to talk about what, or we're going to think about what it would be like if we took seriously our capacity and the positive and negative effects of the things around us on our capacity and where that lid, where we're being capped at in our life. Maybe it's our leadership. Maybe it's our compassion. Maybe it's our empathy. Maybe it's our promotions at work. Maybe we've been hitting this lid and we're like, man, I don't really understand what's going on. Maybe it's just that that we've maxed out some areas in our lives or we haven't paid attention to some areas in our lives where our number, our lid is very low. Our capacity is very low and very limited. And, um, and I was thinking about this because I heard uh, a conversation John Maxwell had with, uh, it was his mentor, Don Stevenson. Uh, he was the CEO uh, and really the, the visionary for global hospitality resources in California. And, um, his business, they would buy failing, like failing resorts, failing hotels, failing restaurants. They were a um, uh, private equity group and uh, that merged into this huge business. And they were, they were buying up all of these failing businesses. And so John Maxwell asked me, he said, Don, listen, um, what, what do you do? Like everything that you buy, you guys turn it around to be incredible. What, what in your life are you doing or what in your company are you doing to produce such amazing results and successful results. And this is what Don Stevenson said, and this, this blew my mind. This is what he told John Maxwell. 
And John Maxwell tells the story so beautifully. He says Don's just sitting there eating a salad, and he's like honestly kind of annoyed with John's question, it seems like. And he, it says he looks up. He said, oh, we only do two things. And John Maxwell said, oh, no, 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 no. no. You, you've got to do more than two things. He said, no, we really only do two things when we buy something that is failing. He's the first thing that we do, if it's a hotel or a restaurant or a resort, we train, we retrain the entire staff on interpersonal relationships, communication skills, and customer service. He said, we we really work on their connection to people because, and I thought about this for you pastors out there, you business owners out there, right? Like you, you, coaches, you got a team out there. He said 90% of the people that do are not repeat customers did not choose to not return because of the product they received, whether it was the meal or the resort experience at the beach, but it was because they received poor customer service. They weren't treated with attention and um, graciousness, right? So, and as a pastor, I was thinking about this. I was like, man, how many visitors walk through our doors? And if you're a pastor listening to this or a small business owner, even how many people walk through our doors and the product that we deliver Right, The thing that we give, and for me as a believer, as a Christian, as a pastor, like I give the greatest thing to the world or I have the opportunity to every week. I get to open the word of life that I believe is it gives us everything that we need for life and encouragement and spirituality and godliness and holiness and all of these things. I get to preach the gospel every week. But I know there are people that walk in our building and they leave and they never come back. And I wonder sometimes if it's because the lid of our hospitality, the lid of our kindness, the lid of our graciousness as a church and even as a team and even myself maybe as a pastor, maybe that lid is low. And so people people aren't offended by the product. They're offended or they're put off by the conduit of that product. And so that's what he said. He said, the first thing that we do is we, we try to get people's hearts right, basically. We try to get their relational skills beefed up. We try to raise that lid of connectedness, right? Because leadership is really just loving the people around you and, and caring about people and wanting the best for people, right? And the, then he said this, and this is the one that shook me, and I really told you that whole long story so I could just get to the second point. But the, the second thing I really, really love, and but at the same time, it kind of shook me. Don Stevenson said, the first thing we do is we invest all of that into customer service and, and you know, interpersonal relationships and giving them social skills. He said, the second thing we do is we immediately fire the CEO. So whatever company that we buy, if it is underperforming and not successful, we fire the CEO. And John Maxwell, he, he's, he's like, whoa, whoa, no, no, like this, this is uncomfortable. I don't like this one. Like you got to do something else other than this. Like why not coach the guy up? Why not, you know, like – and the way he says is light a fire in his office, sing kumbaya together. I don't know, draw out of that guy, those leadership skills. And this is what he says. Don Stevenson said, if he's been a leader that long and he's in the position of CEO and the company is failing, everything rises and falls on leadership. And he did not take advantage of his position as a leader to grow a company, to invest in his people, and to bring something of quality to the world. He's got to go. And you say, TJ, why, like, wh- why do you share that with us? Because I, this is what I'm thinking of. What areas of my life do I need to be fired and rehired in? All right, this is a thought, right? Like what areas of my life, like I can't be fired from being a dad, right? <laughs> like I can't be fired from being my, my wife's husband. I can't be, I mean, I guess I could be fired as a, the pastor here at First Baptist, but like I, I can't be, I can't be fired. There's some roles that are non-negotiables that I can never be fired from. But if I was evaluating myself on this standard, right? That there's some areas that are underperforming. There's some areas that are weak. Where do I need to fire myself and then rehire, cultivate, work on the version of me that I know I can be in Christ and I know I can be for my family, I know I can be for my organization, and then hire that guy, right? Like in my job, in my life, in my relationships, like what's some areas where if someone walked into my life today and began to evaluate with that kind of scrutiny, I would be fired? I think that's something we should ask ourselves. Because if you find an area where you're not being successful or an area where you're, you're walking in consistent defeat, it's probably that there's some, whether it's, you know, your emotional ability or um, your ability to connect with, um, your, your ability to connect with people or to connect with your family or to do the hard work of relationship with your wife, whatever it is, like there might just be some areas where you need to, you need to fire 
that undisciplined version of yourself. You need to fire <laughs> that lazy version of yourself or that jealous version of yourself or that resentful version of yourself or whatever it is and walk back in the next day being who God called you to be and stepping up. Because here's the deal. And I said it earlier, we're not going to blame shift, right? Like in life, we can't blame shift. So the second idea that I began to grapple with from the law of the lid, I started looking at my capacity. Like, okay, there are some areas that I could really tighten up in my life that I wish were better. Well, I'm the only one responsible for my capacity. Like my, my team is not responsible for my level of leadership and my capacity. My wife is not responsible for my capacity to love her, to care for her to honor her, to forgive her, to walk through life with her. My kids are not responsible for my capacity of being a patient father, an instructive father, a kind father, a, a, a disciplining father, right? A father that, that will walk in good discipline. No one else in my life is responsible for my capacity. You are not, you, you are the only one responsible for your capacity. And, and man, I see people do this all the time. And I've done this myself. And that's why, I think that's why I, I'm growing more passionate about this law from John Maxwell, the law of the lid, or what I'm calling the power of capacity, because I'm recognizing in my own life, like it, it's easy to blame. Like you guys have heard my, my story, if you've been listening for any length of time, but like I'm from a broken home. I've experienced multiple step parents on, on both sides, multiple families, multiple step siblings have come into my life and out of my life. So it would be very easy for me, right? Like intellectually, I can, I can work this out. It would be very easy for me to say, well, you know, I don't have a great attachment style or I'm reactive or I grapple with rejection because of my dad or because of my mom or because of X, Y, and Z. Like it would be very easy to shift the blame. And here's what's so sad. There are so many people out there that would pat me on the back and be like, oh man, I'm so sorry for you. no. Like, don't, don't give in to that temptation. I am responsible for who I am today. Like, do those things inform who we have been and some of the things we have experienced? Absolutely. But I am the only one responsible for my capacity today. I'm the only one responsible for the kind of dad I'm going to be today. I'm the only one responsible for the kind of boss that I'm going to be to the employees that God has gifted me with. I am the only one responsible for my capacity to love my wife, serve my wife, honor my wife, romance my wife. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I'm the only one responsible. And so, it, and, and really, I, sometimes I want to just make this like a very practical thing or a psychological thing or even an organizational thing. But at the core of this, this is a spiritual thing. This is something that, that humanity has been grappling with from the very beginning. Like, if you go back to the creation story in the book of Genesis in the Old Testament of the Bible, you find Adam and Eve in this place that was absolutely perfect where everything was provided for them. And God's like, hey, you can, you can have anything. You guys are like naked and unashamed and like life is good, right? Like, and you're a husband and wife, you're doing your thing, whatever. And you can just have the guard, man. You can you, you subdue, you know, like you were over the fish and the birds. Adam, you can even name everything. You know what I'm saying? How cool. And then there's this idea that, that, that they can have something other than God or they need something other than God. So the enemy tempts them and says, did God really say that you can't eat from this tree? And so scripture says that Eve eats from the tree and Adam eats from the tree. And, and it, it was Adam's lack of responsibility. And this is what has always kind of confounded me about the story. Not the fact that they ate the fruit. I, I, I'm pretty sure I would have too, knowing my sinful heart. Like I would have probably fallen sooner than them, right? Like when I think about it, I'm like, man, yeah. Like, it makes sense. But what has always confounded me about the story is that when God confronts Adam, he's like, Adam, what did you do? Adam immediately, immediately points the finger at Eve. Really, he points the finger at God, and he's like, God, this woman that you gave me calls me to eat from the tree. And so instantly, it was built into sinful human DNA to not take 100% responsibility for where you are in life, but to blame shift to other people and even shift the blame back to God. And I can't, I don't think I can appropriately communicate the casualties and the cataclysmic impact that often wreaks havoc in our lives because of our inability to step up 
and lead and take 100% responsibility for where we are. I think about the story often with Adam and Eve. Obviously, they were friends. I mean, they were lovers. They were husband and wife. They were, I mean, I mean, right? Like, they were the only two humans on the world, so they had to have a good relationship. They had to be close, right? They kicked it with God in the garden in the middle of the day. And I think, man, how different would the story you read? Why didn't Adam just say, hey, you know what? Like, man, we got to take responsibility for who we are, Eve. Like, God created us to be better than this. Like, let, let's just, let's say, say no one more day and let's move on. But instead, he he didn't lead. He was passive. And then he started making excuses. And I think about even moving on further in the Old Testament. I told you this was spiritual. You can look back through the people of God and, and see how this has had monumental implications on the lives of people for generations. And th- there's a story in the Old Testament. There's this moment where Moses is on the mountaintop communing with God and and all the children of Israel who were brought out of slavery are all kind of hanging out and they get frustrated. They get impatient. And they're in this moment where they're like, we want to worship something. And so Aaron, who's kind of like Moses's right-hand man, Aaron's like, well, yeah, bring me all the gold from the earrings from you and your wives and your kids' ears, and I'll melt them together and I'll build us a God and we'll just worship this thing. In a moment where like Moses's right-hand man could have stepped up, he could have taken responsibility for where they were as a people. He could have in an, in an instant, he could have said, listen, like, we are not going to do this. We are, we are going to be who God called us to be. We are freed people. And we're not, going to, we're not going to worship something that we created with our own hands. We're going to worship the one true God. He could have taken accountability and responsibility for where he is. He could have stepped up and he could have redirected their hearts. But instead, right? Instead, he, he chooses to be passive, to not take responsibility or accountability and to falter. And I think, man, and I'm, I'm not throwing these guys under the bus. I, I think I'm pointing out these stories because as I thought about this, this podcast over the last couple of days and even last, late last night, I was just kind of sitting with this stuff. I was like, man, I see a reflection of myself and so many people that I get to lead and that I have been led by before. I see these temptations creep into our leadership in multiple areas of our lives. And so it, It really hit me, especially with the story with Aaron, right? Like the people are running to him just for direction. If you look at it, they're just frustrated with Moses being gone so long. He's on the mountaintop hanging out with God. They're in the valley. And he comes up with this idea. Like he he fashions this thing. And so the leader, listen, all of the people, all of their health, all of their future was wrapped up in the lid of, the capacity of their leader. And so the third idea that I started grappling with is I, as I looked over the law of the lid and, and you know, the power of capacity and, and even thinking about this story represented in my own life, I think, man, my organization, my team, my family will only be as healthy as I am. They will only be, if, if I am charged with leading them, they will only be as healthy as I am. So what that means is, Man, if I want to be a good leader and if I want to lead people to a healthy place, if I want to lead people to freedom, like if I want to be that dad that empowers his children with security and, and, and discipline and praise, if I want to be that husband that romances his wife and cultivates a healthy relationship, if I want to be that boss that empowers my team to outlead me, I can't blame shift anymore. If you want to be that kind of leader, that kind of husband, that kind of wife, that kind of friend, that kind of coach, you cannot blame shift anymore. You have to snag a mirror and put it right in front of you and say, I have to take 100% responsibility for who I am, where I am, and where I'm going to go. If you can do that and stop shifting the blame, you will begin to increase your capacity. I I said it, your team, your organization, your family will only be as healthy as you are and at the weakest link, it'll break. Man, if you are, if you are smart, and you're kind, and you're compassionate, but you have this occasional temper tantrum, right? Like if you if you struggle with anger, like if anger's this root of of like dissension in your mind and your heart, or you struggle with jealousy, or you struggle with lust, or whatever it is, across the spectrum that will be the area where your character will be the weakest, where the enemy, life even, 
will try to break your leadership and destroy your organization, your team, and your family. And so we're only as healthy as the things that are the weakest in us that we are willing to work on and grow through the power of the gospel and the glory of God and even in our own self-discipline as we lead ourselves. So what we have to do, here's the thing, we have to identify the weak links in our lives. Things will continue to break at the weakest link until, or they will stop growing and advancing at the lid. Things will always break down at the weakest link or they'll stop growing or advancing at the lid. Sometimes we call these things triggers, right? And especially in psychology and counseling, we call them triggers. But things in our lives that, that hinder or handicap or hiccup our leadership. You say, TJ, how, how do I grow? I'm, I'm going to give it to you in just a second because this is really, really cool. So if you're thinking, man, maybe there are some areas of capacity that I need to, to, to grow in, right? Maybe I am the lid for my team. Maybe I am the lid for my organization. Maybe I am the lid for my family right now. Well, well what am I supposed to do? I'm going to give you four really simple things really quick. This is how we can manage our capacity. And when I say manage our capacity, this is how we can increase our capacity. This is how we can bless our capacity. This is how we can grow in our capacity to lead, love, serve, go, give, parent, whatever, romance, whatever it is, evaluate and adjust. So what I'm going to begin to do, all right, this is, this is one thing that I have control over. I have control over the things that I hear. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it eat will eat its fruit. So if I believe that, often preachers will preach this verse in a way that, um, that really aims at the things that you're speaking. But as I was thinking about this podcast, I was thinking about this element of the things I hear. I started thinking about, or, or thinking about this podcast and the way that I lead, the way that I love, the way that I serve my family and my team. It's like, man, the things that I hear will manage or impact or have implications on my capacity. If I'm hearing negative things, if I'm always being an ear to other people's offenses, if I'm being an ear to gossip, if I'm being an ear to jealousy and an ear to resentment, like even if I'm just being an ear to the noise of the world and political or, 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 or racial tension, if I'm just being an ear to people's preferences and, and, and only allowing negative things to come in my ear, this is what it's going to do. It's going to shrink my capacity to be a good leader because eventually, hear me say this, if we only take in negative content, if we only take in negative, jealous, resentful, whatever it is, regardless if you're Democrat or Republican, whichever side you listen to, if you only take in disdain for another people group or another political affiliation or another religious affiliation, whatever it is, it, I'll say it this way. I heard this great thing not long ago uh, from a young lady. She said, this is what I realized. She said, I was happy in my marriage and I loved my husband. She said, but I started hanging out with some of my single girlfriends or, and even some of my married unhappy friends. And as I listened to them talk, I began to analyze my marriage and become dissatisfied in ways that I know I would not have been frustrated had I not begun to pick apart and borrow those frustrations from other people's conversations. So, so hear me say this today. Be careful when it comes to the things that you allow into your ears, because the things that go in your ears will take root in your heart, all right? Death and life are in the power of the tongue, especially those that we allow to speak into our lives. So the, the things that I hear are going to increase or decrease my capacity, right? They're gonna increase or decrease my influence and my leadership. So I wanna listen to things that are edifying. I wanna listen to things that are life and not death. I wanna listen to things that are correcting in my life, right? I wanna listen to things that are encouraging. I wanna listen to things that are true. I wanna listen to the good. And it, not that, not listen to things that I just don't like because some of the things that are good, I won't like them. I, I won't like correction, I won't like stern encouragement in areas where I need to clean up my life or I need to shape up my leadership or I need to, to do better as a husband or a dad or whatever it is or, or as a, a business leader. But those negative things, those divisive things, those, those, little toxic, those little toxic words and phrases that get 
trapped in your ears and work their way to your heart, man, you can't, we got to get rid of those things or it will limit our capacity to lead well. The second thing is this, the things that I read, the things that I, I intentionally open up and begin to read, like, am I reading the, the, I mean, we don't read newspapers anymore, you know what I'm saying? But like, like, what am I, what am I dead brain scrolling on TikTok, right? Like, what am I reading? What, what are the little text across the screen that I'm reading? What algorithm has grabbed a hold of my heart because my thumb has taken my brain's algorithm there and it's married now and I'm reading this content over and over and over online. Are the things that you're reading, here's a question I'm, I'm asking you because I'm asking myself this, the things not just that I'm listening to, but the things that I'm looking at with my eyes and reading, are those things programming my heart to life or are they reducing my capacity to be a good leader? They're going to do one or the, one or the other. So the things that I hear, the things that I read, and then this, the things that I say, like, am I speaking life or am I speaking death? Am I living out that Proverbs 18, 21 idea that death and life are in the power of the tongue? Do I take serious the things that I'm saying out of my mouth? Do I talk to my team in a way that honors them and makes them feel safe? Do I talk to my children in a way to where they feel accepted in my presence and they feel like I'm an approachable dad? Do I say things to my wife that builds up her confidence and allows her to safely trust me? Do I say things to my friends that give them a safe place to be held accountable but, but, but to also thrive in relationship. Here's the question. Is the things that I am saying, are they increasing my capacity to lead or are they decreasing? Because it's going to be one or the other. I'm going to say this every point. And the last thing, and I think this is the most important when I'm thinking about managing capacity. So it's not just the things that we hear. It's not just the things that we read. It's not just the things that we say, but it is definitely the people that we let into our space. Um, I heard this great statistic, and, and um, John Maxwell actually has a, in the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, there's a whole law on the power of the inner circle. This doesn't come from the law of the power of the inner circle. This comes from, um, uh, this lady was talking uh, about uh, performance percentages, and this is what she said. She said, if you take um, someone with good work ethic and you sit them next to an overachiever, that's smarter than them and works harder than them. Person A will increase their output and their capacity by 15% if you put them by someone who is an overachiever and more intelligent with them. So they will begin to they will begin to think up, perform up, lead up to the person that is closest to them. And this is what she said. She shared another statistic that blew my mind. She said, however, if you take that same person who has the ability to increase their leadership capacity, their intelligence, right, their work ethic by 15%. If you take that same person and you put them with an underperformer, you will get a 30% decrease in output. You will get a 30% decrease in attention to detail. You will get a 30% decrease on average when it comes to leadership. And, and I was thinking about this. I was like, man, yeah, like, like that is so true. We, we see that play out all the time. And, and one way I, I love college football, right? And you see this happen all the time and we don't even realize it in college football. You may not be a football fan, so just bear with me for a minute. But you, you'll see like the University of Georgia play like Jackson State or the University of Alabama or, or uh, like UAB or somebody like that, right? Like, like a nobody scrub team from nowhere. And you will see them play like the most ridiculous first half ever like they they might be tied with this no-name team that is not nearly as talented you'll see them play almost like they're playing 30 percent below their ability and capabilities and then they go to halftime right and and there's this this window where it's just them and their coach who knows more than them right their coach that 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 can coach them up remind them of who they are and they're sitting around all the winners and the leaders they come out and they destroy that that lesser team the second half like and, and then the next week you see them play an elite team like a an Alabama, right? Like the University of Georgia specifically talking about them. You see them play in Alabama or like back in the day or a really good LSU or, or, or another college team that, that's in an elite status, Ohio maybe. And all of a sudden they're they're playing out of their minds. And they don't even look like the team the week before. I am convinced 
that that is that statistic on display for the world to see, that that is our lives. If you surround yourself with people who do not have work ethic, who do not have good morals, who do not carry an ethical standard like you do, who do not have dreams and goals and visions that align with maybe your own heart, your own integrity, and, and the direction that you're going in your life. If you, don't, if you surround yourself with people who are like that, I don't want to call them losers, all right, but, but like you surround yourself with people who aren't going anywhere and they don't have anything going for them and they don't want to get out of that position, it is much easier for them to pull you further down than if you would surround yourself with people who are like-minded, who, man, they're overachievers, they're great thinkers, they push you, they encourage you, they challenge you. You'll see yourself lead up to that level. I say this all the time, and people have asked me, they're like, man, TJ, especially back in the day when I traveled all the time with, the, with, the, with my worship band, they're like, man, TJ, you guys, it seems like y'all get better and better. You're just, you're incredible. I used to hear that all the time. For the last probably eight to 10 years of the worship ministry that I've traveled, I am the least talented person on the stage, typically. And I want it that way. I, I've wanted to be surrounded by people who were musically, they were better than me, right? Like their work ethic, they outworked me and because it drew me, it caused me to step up to, to who I am and who I could be. But here's the thing, and, and this is, I'm, I'm chasing a rabbit for just a second because we're all friends here and, and you're going to let me chase this rabbit, I guess, if you'll hang with me for just a few more minutes. But when I was younger in ministry and in leadership, I liked to be surrounded by people that I was better than because I was insecure and I was jealous. I mean, that's just full transparency. The longer that I've been in ministry and the longer that I've been in leadership, when I spot someone better than me, I usually try to hire them. <laughs> like truly when I, when I spot somebody that I'm like, mm, I'm good at this, but you're great at this. I want you on my team. And I think that comes with maybe security and, and, and maturity and time in ministry. And God's been very gracious to me in that. But, and, and this is what I've, I recognize, as I've surrounded my, intentionally surrounded myself with people who are better than me, it's made me better. It's made me step up. It, it's made me want to be the man that I want, that, that I know God has called me to be. It's made me want to be the pastor, want to be the leader, want to be the friend that I know that I can be. So take 100% responsibility. And and this is the last thing. I do want to share this verse with you when I was thinking about the people we surround ourselves with. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says this, bad company ruins good morals. And I would say the, the inverse is true, right? Like good company can create in us a better culture, right? That's just my quote. That's not scripture. That's me talking, all right? But like bad company, if bad company can ruin good morals, then man, good company can help us create a more efficient culture, a better culture, uh, just a beautiful culture, really. Because here's the last thing. Here's the last point I'll make, and then I'll leave you guys alone because you've been hanging out with me for a while today. Your capacity to lead or your lid can change if you're willing to do the work. I gave you an example and a picture of that, how early in ministry, early in ministry, I, I, was, I was insecure in things. I used to think, you know, I sang, and I was like, oh, man, I, have, I would always think, like, I have the worst voice in the room, and, and, you know, like, I'm not a great preacher, I'm not a great leader, blah, 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 blah. I was so self-deprecating. I used to beat myself up, and I still do that sometimes in my head and my heart. I have just got more wise not to always articulate those, those untruths about myself, right? But when I recognized, and it had a lot to do with the law of the live, when I recognized that I could take some practical steps to become more secure in Christ, more secure in who I am as a man, as a father, as a husband, as a leader, as a, a friend, all of these things, I began to make some practical changes. And I know this sounds silly, but I want to tell you this. If you're willing to do the work, I, I remember um, I remember the moment as a worship leader, this started to change for me. Um, I used to lead worship with a guy named Matt Tomlinson, who to this day is one of my favorite male vocalists. Um, his, his theological brain, he is literally one of the smartest worship leaders I've ever known as far as intelligence goes. Um, his theological wisdom, his ability to hear parts and harmony supersedes me tenfold. His ability to play electric and to mix sound and understand frequencies, he is, he is amazing. He's like, he's like Graco, the guy that mixes the sound um, for this podcast. He, well, I call him the wizard. I'll never forget, I, there were times that I would be insecure around Matt, and 
and and I felt it grab my heart almost like, oh man, you, you'll never be at this level. So you know what I did? When we started leading worship places, I would say, hey, Matt, will you lead a song? Would you just not, not don't just play electric. Would you lead a song? I began to actively fight against some of the insecurities by stepping into the things that made me secure and just walking in them. Be like, hey man, would you sing? Hey man, would you lead? Hey man, would you, would you give a spiritual thought here? Because if we don't do that, we will never change. If we stay in our insecurities, if, if we talk to ourselves in a self-deprecating way, if we read things that are unhealthy, if we let people around us who are not calling us up and calling out of us the things that God wants us to be, we will never change. But if we will do the hard work, if we will put in time in our marriages and our friendships, on our teams, the people that we're coaching, in base level in our friendships, man, if we'll speak life, if we'll read things together that are constructive and healthy, if we'll say things to each other that are challenging and joyful and good, if we let the right people in, and and if we're bold enough to walk away or step out of circles with people who continually to negatively affect us, our capacity for leadership can transform. Our capacity for leadership can grow, and our lid does not have to stay here. We can elevate the lid in our organization and in our personal lives if we're willing to do the work. So, Hear me say it like this as I wrap up. Guard and think about the things that you're hearing, the things that you're saying, the things that you're reading, and the people that you're letting in because you truly have the capacity. You truly have the power to increase your capacity to lead in your life if you will do the hard work. All right? Listen, I love y'all. I'm so glad that... um, I'm glad that you'll listen, right? I'm glad that I get to write these things down and think about this stuff and pray about this stuff. And I'm, I'm glad there's a, a group of people, there's an audience that that you, you know, every other week you you click on this link and you you hang out with us. And my our team is so grateful. And again, if, if this is beneficial to you, like it, share it, subscribe. Um, and again, man, if there's if you have questions about leadership, if you have a topic that you want us to cover, if there's something about the gospel, if there's some some biblical stuff that you're wondering about or relationship things, just shoot us an email at TJ Malden Leadership Podcast at gmail.com and we would we would love to address that. But again, listen, raise the lid in your life, increase your capacity to lead by doing the hard work that you need to. I love you guys. See ya. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the TJ Malden Leadership Podcast, where we talk about life, leadership, and the gospel. If you enjoyed this episode, share with a friend. For more content, follow us on Instagram and YouTube. If you have any questions you would like to ask TJ, whether it is about life, leadership, or the gospel, you can email those to TJ Malden Leadership Podcast at gmail.com. Thank you again for listening, and we hope you join us again on the TJ Malden Leadership Podcast.